welcome to the Mr. Bill podcast. Um, thanks for taking the time to to do this. And yeah, I'm really excited for this chat based on sort of the current uh, world of music technology and, and some of the stuff that's happening. And you seem to be kind of at the at the forefront of that. Do you, um, maybe we can start by you sort of like introducing yourself, what you do, all that kind of stuff. Sure. Yeah. Really happy to be here. This is one of the few podcasts that I actually listen to regularly. Um, uh, hey, I'm Zach Evans. I, um, I, I run the Harmony community. That is the music research branch of Stability AI. We are focused on uh, generative AI tools for musicians, um, kind of seeing how all this technology can progress to be beneficial to artists and also to, you know, lower the bar for music production to get more people able to get into that creative process. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I guess maybe to explain a little more about the tools, I've explained it a few times on my podcast before, specifically Dance Diffusion is the one that I'm the most familiar with from you. And uh, and I believe the way I described it was incorrect. But basically, it's a, from what I understand, it's a fork of stable diffusion which is uh, an AI thing that everyone knows about where you can put in a text prompt or whatever and it spits out an image. Or I think now it can even do some some video stuff if you have like mods attached to it and whatnot. And you basically like took that and you forked it and you turned it into the equivalent thing but for audio. So now you can give it a bunch of audio, train a model, and then it can spit out a bunch of audio that's similar to that. So um, maybe you could uh, give us... a a better description than I can of the of what Dance Diffusion is and um, kind of how that came to be and and all that. For sure. So Dance Diffusion, uh, that came out, I think, August or September 2022. Uh, and that is, so the, the high level concept here is Diffusion Models, um, this newer uh, AI model technology that basically is just really good at taking noise and crossfading from noise into signal. Uh, what that signal is depend on on what you actually feed it. This is actually being created um, concurrently to Stable Diffusion. There have been a few Diffusion models that were released by uh, OpenAI back in 2021 uh, alongside a model called Clip that was basically just a, a way to check how much does this caption, this image match. And with their you know, OpenAI's Diffusion model that wasn't trained to take in image prompts or, 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 or text prompts or anything, it was just... I'm going to denoise noise into images. You could put those two models together, that that um, image denoiser and that how well does this image match this prompt. And that kind of through some computational optimization process gave us our first text-to-image models in the open source. Um, so Dance Diffusion was kind of taking that same concept and trying to apply it to audio. Really, it's actually a scaled-up version of this model from uh, Sony Music called Crash, so they did a similar thing of this unconditional diffusion, unconditional meaning you're not giving it during training time, text prompt, whatever. You're just saying here is audio, noise it and denoise it. Um, so dance diffusion was basically taking that idea of crash, which crash was just on drums. So it just would make uh, kicks, snares and, and hats um, and trying to kind of scale that up to work at a bit of a longer length. Uh, you know, Crash was like 24,000 samples, like a third of a second. Dance Diffusion gets up to about three seconds. Um, and that's from a few years ago. So now on the back end, we're looking much more at extending that, uh, you know, keeping the, trying to keep the quality bar high um, and bringing that to, well, ideally as long as like people actually need. Um, so Dance Diffusion is kind of the most basic audio diffusion thing you can do of just here is audio. I'll give you a bunch of it. The, the main model that people tend to use is this J-Man model trained on the works of Jonathan Mann, who is this songwriter who's been doing a song a day since like 2004. He's done over 5,000 songs. Got in a conversation with him. Uh, he actually been working with the Databots guys before. Um, so he sent us basically all of his music and said, you know, go ahead, train a model. My goal is to be able to have a model that can keep doing my song a day project, you know, <laughs> after I'm no longer doing it, you know, that, that, that kind of immortalized me in a model kind of thing. Um, so to, to start with that, basically, yeah, Dance Diffusion was still very short. And part of that is kind of the difference between images and audio, you know, high fidelity audio is just the number of, you know, floating point values you need to represent an image. So 256 image, you've got 
you know, times three for RGB images, uh, doesn't quite compare to the, say, 8 million samples or 16 million audio samples in like a three minute song. Um, so yeah, Dance Diffusion was basically this, you can train it on, you know, it was trained on just Jonathan Mann's songs. You know, it does kind of acoustic folk stuff. And so the outputs from the bass model will just be like little clips of this guy playing guitar or a bit of his voice, which no one wants those outputs directly, right? You know, maybe Jonathan Mann will use that to try to inspire a song or something. But the benefit of these models is that with that, with that bass model, with that bass knowledge kind of of how sound works, you could then take that and pretty quickly fine tune that on your own uh, data set. So that's kind of been the main use case for Dance Diffusion is taking that and like you've seen, fine tuning it on drum loops or bass sounds or break beats, something like that to get kind of this random generated output um, of of new sounds and because of kind of the the artifacts in that model and the ways it can do things wrong interestingly it kind of brings its own form of distortion its own form of weirdness that can be you know interesting and new mm. um, so since then a lot of the work has been kind of trying to build that out to be um, you know adding in things like text prompts building up our stable audio product which is then trained more on the you know with with text prompt with metadata making it more promptable and a bit more controllable. Mm. So how is it technically working? Like how how does this, because I mean, I've used Dance Diffusion, right? And on the user end, it basically looks like you have this model that was uh, supplied by by you, uh, either the Jonathan Mann one, the Glitch.cool one, or like all these models that were trained on some data set. And then <clears throat> you put that in to the UI, which is either Google Collab or the Dion Timmer one. And then you point it towards a folder of sounds that you want it to be similar to. And then you say, start training. And then what happens? What's it doing? Um, so this does get into the actual logistics of AI model training. Um, so what it's doing is, uh, you know, it'll it'll go through that, that folder of... Uh, audio that you you provide it you give it some root directory it'll go through find all the audio files and um try to think about how how deep into the actual logistics of ai training to get here but you know it'll it's essentially taking each one of those audio files you give it giving it some random amount of noise so you know i, th I think about this as like like it's, it's kind of this crossfade power law crossfade thing like you think about you know CDJ, you got your crossfade thing there. It's not necessarily fully linear. It's got kind of that that curve to it. It's really that same thing. We crossfade it along some point on that, crossfading between that, you know, say bass sound you gave us, or or that, you know, you 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 supply to the actual training run and just pure white noise. And we say, all right, this is 70% of the way to white noise. Can you predict what the denoised version is? Um, mathematically, it's a little bit. It's more like finding a kind of a thing between the signal and noise, but it ends up basically saying, you know, tell me what of this and noise and what was what was actually signal. And to be able to do that, you know, it's going through a big uh, a big AI model, um, which I know is a very vague phrase, but I kind of picture them as being like giant Ableton effect racks. You know, it's all still convolutional units. It's all still like I think that's kind of at a high level. Um, electronic producers are actually pretty well placed to understand a lot of these things because it is still digital pr signal processing. So it's going through, say, a bunch of convolutional filters, um, and then it uses a bit of a bit of calculus to figure out, all right, how wrong was I? You know, here's, here's what I think the denoised version is. It was actually this. How wrong was I? Now you can tweak all of those little convolutional filters a little bit so that next time around it'll be a little bit more correct. So by running that same process over and over again, say taking, you know, 16 at a time, four at a time, whatever, that's your, that's your batch size in there. Um, it's basically just a repeated process of you find some number, you know, all, all, all machine learning does is basically how to figure out how to make some number smaller. And so you, you calculate some number of how bad it is and try to get that number of how bad it is to be smaller. Like at a very basic level, that is pretty much all of, you know, current machine learning. Um, that number of how bad it is, is like your, it's called your loss value. And it's either, you know, uh, how far was it from the correct answer or, you know, uh, uh, it's all this mathematical regression stuff. And so in, in diffusion, you're trying to basically have the loss go down. Like how well did it match kind of the denoised version of this? Um, mm. so it's basically so in, almost like what a human does, except they, 
it just like runs tests constantly for itself much. and and tries to stay honest to its if it's correct or not and yeah. just gets better and better over time. Right. And it's not like it, it's this purely high dimensional floating point math thing it's not like there's some underlying actual code being written saying like if it has a drum trains yeah it's a drum and we want it to do this it's mm. all just like take this number and and multiply it by 0 0.2576 plus you know negative 0 0.38 times the one next to it and you know that's that's all convolutions right convolutions are all just like delays and gain changes really but at a very high scale so you know dance diffusion has like 300 400 million parameters in it so that means that there's you know imagine having you know a, a bunch of eq threes or whatever but like f a thousand of them in parallel and the next thing is like another five thousand in parallel or whatever and <laughs> tweaking all of those to do exactly what you want um that's what a lot of stuff ends up being um and so that's why it's really interesting to come at this from a you know i spent uh, a good chunk of time kind of starting from when lockdown started getting on discord meeting producers getting really like diving deep into the you know bass music production scene um and kind of seeing like the the similarities here and also seeing kind of some low-hanging fruit in terms of the quality of this stuff so things like it's been there, there's some orthodoxy in the scene that comes from the fact that a lot of machine learning for audio comes from speech not from music so things mm -hmm. like, oh, everything is 16K sample rate in mono. Well, that can work right. fine if you're just doing like, you know, speech over a telephone or whatever. You're trying to have efficient speech codecs, but try to bring that into music. And it's like, what year is it? Why is everything so <laughs> low bit rate and low quality? Um, where, where are all the hi-hats? Um, <laughs> you know, that and then things like phase mangling. There was this kind of big uh, paper on tone transfer a few years ago, timbre transfer from Google that was like, hey, actually, if you just like, people can't really tell relative phase. So if you just don't try to model the phase and just do the, uh, the magnitude, no one will be able to tell. That works when you're working with like a clarinet or like right. a trumpet or a steady state monophonic signal. But as any, you know, bass producer will tell you, phase matters, phase affects texture mm. and phase affects, um, you know, how we perceive a lot of things. Uh, yeah, like and drum try transients. To make a, try to make a nice snare. Whilst <laughs> exactly. <that's> the case. Yeah. <laughs> try to make a nice snare when the model thinks that all phase variations are all equally valid. You won't. Um, right. And so that's been a kind of thing to come in. It's like, oh, well, if I just have this bar of like, you know, at least 44K stereo and don't ignore phase, then I'm already a step above, you know, some some of the big labs coming in. Of course, it makes things <laughs> trickier. That's part of why they, they had the similar, the, the simpler versions of it. But you know, it's, it's a nice space to come in. Like I wasn't working in machine learning before I started this job a few years ago. I was at Microsoft mm. doing like front end web development stuff. Um, and then, so it was nice to have that kind of like that background in production to know, like, I, I know what producers want. I know what they complain about. I know, um, you know, I, I saw things like pitch map where it's like, here's this new technology that's actually like 10 years old or whatever, but a new way to change sounds and it became, you know, kind of blew up as like this. Yeah, like created a long whole genre. The, <laughs> exactly. Right. So I'm like, all right, kind of looking around here and seeing these new things, these neural synthesis technologies, tone transfer. And at the very basic level, just thinking, hey, this is some new math that I think the production community could really use right now. You know, mm. I'm, I'm, there's been some awesome releases in the last few years of things like new resonators, new synths. Um, but I think it's still a point of diminishing returns with a lot of the classic DSP things that we've, we're kind of hitting up against a wall. Um, and so I'm really curious to see how much this neural synthesis, uh, you know, generative synthesis kind of stuff can, can add a new, a new flavor palette to, to, to sound design. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So continuing from the first question, from a user perspective, the other thing that Dance Diffusion does other than the training is you put the model that you then trained into the UI, either on Google Collab or Dion's thing. And then you say, I want a batch size of this and a sample rate of this and, and all that you put the parameters in and then you just hit go and point it towards a folder and it will just like spit out sounds. <laughs> um, so what, what is, what's going on on that end after the training and everything? Yeah, so that is, um, that's what we'd call inference uh, for these models. So there's these kind of two phases of AI things. There's training of getting the, the model to have all the right numbers inside of it and then inference of actually using it. 
Um, so when you've got the you know, when you hit go on Dance Diffusion, um, you know, there's no prompt in that case. Let's say you're not doing any interpolation or or things like that. Um, yeah, you're just saying here's the model. Give me right. a bunch of sounds. So literally, what it does, it will sample white noise, uh, and then it'll run through the model, however many however, whatever your step count is, and it'll start out by saying, "All right, here is white noise, and the noise level is a hundred percent." And then it will have some guess on what the denoise version should be, right? Because the model's only job is you give me audio and the noise level, and I will give you some version of what I think is the denoised output. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of conceit of diffusion models is that it's not very good at that at any individual step. But if you keep doing that over and over again, it can actually come to a, a, good, a good conclusion. This gets into like differential equations and and math that's above my head but it kind of makes sense intuitively of like all right here is a hundred percent noise give me signal and it'll give you something that is not noise but not totally you know a snare or whatever you want and then we go okay good job it's actually I'm quite add back good at like 98 percent noise and then 96 and then 95 and then kind of that going down and down and down giving it less and less noise and having it it actually has to commit to some of the details that it's made. But doing that iterative denoising process, it'll eventually kind of converge towards something from your training space or even better, something that isn't actually your training data, but would be kind of mathematically nearby it, hence giving you some, some novelty. Mm. Yeah, I think because it uses this process to create sounds, like it starts with noise and works its way backwards, I've found it's not extremely good for like really clean sounds, but it is really good and, a, and it totally makes usable stuff for stuff that's supposed to be pretty noisy anyway, like snares, breaks, hi-hats, cymbals, stuff like that. Um, and is, is that why it's noisy? Because it starts yeah. from noise? Or? Yeah, I think that's, that's certainly part of it. It's going to be a lot better at modeling anything that is itself modeled, well modeled as transients. Um, so mm. it's really good for drum loops, you know, break beats are like, I was, <laughs> when I first started trying this out, I was trying to think of what kind of audio do I want to try this out? And I started with break beats because my thought was like, that is a kind of audio where there's not that much of it. People would want more of it. It's, you know, it's hard to make a new 1960s classic funk break. Yeah, you really got, have to go to a studio and do right, that. Right, exactly. I mean, you can maybe use addictive drums, but even at some point when you're doing that, they went to a studio at some point. Right, yeah. And so being able to take, you know, older breaks and train a model on that and be able to have it give you actual, like, new breaks, that mm. kind of, like, you know, a pretty obvious use case of, like, oh, hey, that's something that's, like, hard to do naturally, but almost trivial for these kinds of models to do, where it's, like, because it's all transient content, um, you know, it's not a whole bunch of like high end harmonics it has to deal with. So mm -hmm. that's been kind of a lot of, you know, you, you bring up a good point there of like trying to figure out, okay, how did we get this to model audio that is not easily modelable modelable as noise? So like, like I'm sure you've tried out with, with dance diffusion, you've tried to do it on like, you know, a synth arp or like some, a vocal, or a vocal or something that just kind of like just messes up everything above a certain point. It's all just kind of, it's noisy. Um, and so that gets into the next step, which is latent diffusion. And this is actually the technology that uh, made stable diffusion work so much better and so much faster than the older diffusion models. So back in back in my day, when I was doing like disco diffusion stuff, it was like 10 minutes to get an image because mm. uh, it would be like 10 seconds to send the whole 1024 square image through the model. And then I had to do that 200 times. Um, and so that's just a really a... a a factor of how much data are you sending through the model at any given time. So for dance diffusion right now, say you take the three second model, that is um, 131072 samples. So a 44K sample rate, that's about 2.7 seconds, something like that. And why, why is it that number? Is that because that's how many actual samples there are in three seconds of a 44.1K file? So it's basically 44.1K times three. It's more that uh, AI models work well with powers of two. So okay. that is two to the something. Um, it's, you know, six, five, five, three, six times two. So I guess it'd be two to the 16 or 17. Um, uh, uh, and also part of what the model is doing is internally um, dance diffusion and our early stable audio stuff uses what's called a unit. So it's constantly like downsampling the audio internally. And so because it's always like cutting it by a factor of two, it helps if the overall length is a factor of two. So it doesn't like try to cut it in half and, and not be able to. Mm, gotcha. Um, 
So it ends up being mostly just like an actual model limitation thing. But because the dance fusion model is trying to send through, you know, a hundred, whatever, a thousand samples through, that's a big number for audio, for, for, you know, uh, uh, for AI models, like chat GPT and things will start sending through, you know, they, they start with a cap and this gets into things of like the attention mechanism and convolution and memory scaling and things like that. But uh, uh, long story short, it's hard to get long sequences like that to play well with models. And so the the uh, the next step there is to train compression models. So basically training a an audio codec, something kind of like, um, you know, an MP3 codec, an encoder and decoder, what's called an autoencoder. You basically train the model to reconstruct the audio it's given, but the model goes through like an information bottleneck where there's just, it has to go through a part where there's just fewer numbers. So it has to learn how to compress it and then decompress it. What has actually led to some incredible advancements in audio codecs and like, you know, 500 bits per second audio that still sounds listenable or whatever. Um, Mm. And so that's how you get a lot of the, you know, if if you want to get past like a few seconds, you need to train those compression algorithms, these auto encoders, um, which actually ends up being the same kind of technology that's used in things like Rave or Combobulator. Um, It really just ends up being an auto encoder. Um, And so once you've done that, you can ideally train that, that codec in a way where it's like, not necessarily representing data in the same way. Like maybe it's representing high frequency content through a lower frequency encoding and it's more noise resistant. And so when you do diffusion on that, you know, it still has that problem of like it has a hard time doing high frequency harmonic content. But in that encoding space, you don't have to worry about that. If everything is encoded into more low frequency data. Like you're you're basically saying you inside the model turn the audio file that would otherwise be whatever like a hundred megabyte wave file or whatever down into yeah. like a you know 60 kilobyte mp3 right. that would probably sound almost unlistenable to a human and just sound like dog shit but to the computer it's information still that that it can train on and make sense yeah of. and so you're not like actually directly down sampling it in the same way it turns it into this this you know theoretical mathematical space where it's like well down sample the audio so stereo two channel audio by like 2000 times but that encoding is now 64 channels so it's kind mm-hmm. of like bringing it down in length but expanding it in channels so it's like there's an information capacity stuff there you wouldn't be able to listen to that directly um, and then you train another model essentially to decode that compressed space into actually good audio that still sounds high fidelity um, so that you don't have to have all the outputs sound like you know low quality mp3s unless you're training on low quality mp3s in which case that is the <laughs> audio space that you will probably still end up with in a way that is kind of like how a human works, right? Like you could listen to some like dog shit recording through that was recorded in the 60s on or like, you know, let's say uh, the early 90s on like a shitty DSLR camera yeah. at, at like a festival of whatever. And it sounds like shit. You listen to it on YouTube. There's barely any pixel. You can barely make shit up. But you as a human can look at that and get inspiration from yep. it and be like, that gives me an idea and output some high quality music from that yeah. either on your instruments or in your DAW or whatever. So in a way, it's kind of similar, right? It's like you're giving it this shitty stuff, but it can still pass that as it can something still, yeah, to, I mean, to turn into an output that right, is not it's a like shitty it, output. You, you basically turn the audio data into a format that's easier for the computer to reckon with and mathematically deal with. And then, you know, if that process all goes well, ideally that, that encoding, that, that's where the term latent space comes from, is that encoding space. When you go from audio into that encoding space, back into audio, that middle part is the latent space, which is where things like latent diffusion come from. Mm-hmm. Um, and just for clarity, so when, whenever you say diffusion, you're talking about mm-hmm. doing some sort of comparison thing against white noise, right? Yeah, diffusion, it's, I mean, it comes from, again, like, you know, heat diffusion and differential equations and things like that. But it's it's really modeling this process of um, of diffusion of, you know, imagine you've got a, a bunch of particles here and they kind of diffuse over time. Your modeling is, is technically denoising diffusion models is the full name because diffusion is the process of adding noise. Really, we want to use that then to model the process of removing noise. So the denoising diffusion models. But diffusion is basically any of that, that concept of being able to, um, you know, given given some level of noise data, predict the denoised version of that. Um, and basically, you know, the, mo- the models end up so good at, at, at turning noise into signal that you can give them pure noise and they will turn it into some signal. Um, and then it gets into extra conditioning things like here's the noise, you can turn it into some signal given this text prompt. 
Um, I think it's actually a pretty basic intuition for that. I think about clouds. You know, you're looking at a cloud, looking at the clouds, and someone's, oh, that one looks like a cat. And you might look at it, and your brain will kind of figure out, oh, what do they mean by that? Oh, I guess that could be the tail. That's the head. Though that's kind of a leg. Um, and so using that, you know, the extra text prompt, it can kind of like figure out where in the noise it'll find some some patterns of what you mean. And it kind of reinforce that over time of like, hey, now I'm going to kind of making it look more like that. Then I'll add in more noise. And then I'll still say, oh, it's still a cat. I go, okay, yeah, now I can add in more details here because <laughs> last time I added in half a leg. You know, I can finish that leg, whatever, that kind of thing. Um, and it's just, it's been fascinating, like, it's the, the the code is pretty simple. The code to train these things, the core algorithm is like seven lines of pretty simple, you know, grade school mathematics, basically some <laughs> some subtractions some multiplication, you know, um, maybe a few a few square operators in there, maybe a sign or something. But um, the the you know, the, the, one of the, the kind of go to sayings in, in ML is that simple is scalable. Um, so being able to take a, a basic thing like that, but then throw way more compute at it, throw a bigger model at it. Um, it's, it's impressive how much quality comes from just like that basic process. You don't have to do a whole lot of feature engineering or um, by that, I mean, like specifically saying, OK, here is the idea. I'm going to bake into this model the idea of a 12 tet scale or something like that. We aren't doing that. We're basically just saying here's digital data. Figure out what music is. And it does. <laughs> Because to be able to turn something from noise to signal, you have to know what signal is. You have to end up learning the actual space of audio to be able mm. to make that number go down. This is an interesting thing too, right? Because I, I did notice when I was training models on Dance Diffusion that I would use the original model, right? Which is like Jonathan Mann stuff. And that was nothing like what I wanted it to be outputting. I wanted it to be like a brakes loop or a, yeah. you know, do a bass or like some neuro bases or something like that. And pretty quickly, like within 20 minutes or so, it could get me there. And yeah. the theory that I have for that is that what sounds are and what and what music is to a human brain is such a small subset yep. of all white noise. Absolutely. Can you kind of explain that further and, and what you mean? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. So that is basically, you know, if you take the entire space of possible audio outputs, most of it is noise. You know, most, yeah, of, it most not, of it is not like listenable. We, we, yeah, we don't like it. Like we um, like yeah. such a small amount of shit. We like exactly. mostly stuff in four four. We mostly stuff in these few scales. Yeah, stuff that is like harmonically related. It's like such a tiny thing for a computer. I was really surprised and pleasantly surprised with how well Dance Diffusion fine tunes. You know, fine tuning is that process of basically continuing training but with a different data set, either a subset of your large or you know, previous training data set or an entirely different one. So in this case. Like we're saying, you know, it's trained entirely on Jonathan Mann's largely acoustic instrumentals, him sitting with a mic and a guitar singing about his day or whatever. But all of a sudden you can turn it into these like wild neuro Reese's, you know, with, with even a pretty small data set. Um, you know, my my comparison there is like DNA. You know, it'll be like we share 96 percent of DNA with a banana or whatever. Right. Because it's like the basic <laughs> fundamental, you know, basic operations of DNA are all pretty similar. Cellular respiration and, you know, creating life or whatever. So the actual differences in DNA between us and, you know, a, a monkey or whatever, maybe actually some really minuscule parts that are just enough for us to be a different, you know, a different species or whatever. But the core, the core basis there is still a lot of shared stuff. And so the core basis of what makes sound, you know, recognizing, oh, there's a logarithmic aspect to this, um, recognizing, you know, there's, there's rhythm to this. Um, a lot of that translates between sounds that we may see as very different, like, you know, acoustic folk and neuro Reese's, but in terms of the actual overall space of sound, they're pretty close. If you take that idea and you scale it up to what you just said with DNA, that also probably means that there's a high chance that being an object in space is a very small subset of all possible things that can exist. Yeah. Yeah. Kind I of, think that kind of mind blowing. Yeah. And so it's like, it, it all ends up being, you know, this very abstract mathematical thing of trying to regress to the, the modal distribution of signal given noise, or maybe the conditional probabilities of all that. Um, 
I just love it from like a, a theoretical philosophical context of like, oh, if you just reverse entropy, if you just learn how to reverse entropy, you can make the world. It's like, no, that, that, that kind of makes sense. So, you know, denoise and diffusion models are basically like, here's an entropy reverser, um, which is not a process we can normally do. Um, yeah, true. It's interesting <laughs> to see what we, can, what we can do with that. True. So dance diffusion, no longer your main thing, right? You're pretty much like right. a dumb, dumb with that project. So maybe you could talk us through what it is that you're doing now. Yeah. So really trying to scale all the idea. I mean, dance diffusion, I think I'm going to keep that name as just the unconditional audio level stuff. I might have a dance diffusion 2.0. Um, we have our product of stable audio, which is website, you know, stable audio.com that is, uh, text to song, text to sample, um, and that's all uh, uh, trained on uh, data from Audio Sparks, a stock music provider we made a deal with. So it's a revenue share deal there, where lots of artists there provided a bunch of their music through through Audio Sparks, uh, which had great metadata, things like really detailed descriptions, tempo, BPM, things like that. Um, and then we, you know, we have a subscription service there, and you know, part of that subscription money goes back to Audio Sparks to actually compensate the the artists for this. Um, and then anything you get from there, you render from there, you could do like, you know, here's a, a tech house drum loop or even just a nice snare. Um, you know, it's it's the the library is largely stock music, but there's a lot of good stuff in there still. There's still high quality music in there. Um, and so we're we, we, we have that launched. Um, that's been great for just like making just samples to throw into your songs, make like a, a, a long drone or whatever, or some textures and then, and then add more to that. Um, or, you know, have it render a full song and get some ideas and take clips from that. And like you were saying, like rendering a lower quality thing, getting an idea and then actually finalizing it yourself. Mm. So that's on the, the commercial side. Um, my, you know, the goals of our, our, our community though, uh, Harm and I are much more around open source stuff. Um, and it's tricky with with data, what you can do open source. We have that data deal with Audio Sparks doesn't allow for open source release. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Stability AI is absolutely an open source company, um, but that's more to say technicality of the deal to be able to get that data. Um, and so we're also looking at open source models versions of this. Right now, I'm working on one that's like a 12 second model text to audio, um, and for that, we're looking at things like Free Sound, Free Music Archive, you know, Creative Commons audio. Um, to, to get a base model there. And so the hope is that we get out some, you know, base model, say 12 seconds or whatever, running much, much faster than Dance of Fusion. You could get it on ideally in like inferencing on five gigabytes of RAM, which will work on like pretty much any, you know, GPU. Hmm. So not, not necessarily not Mac, locked. that's trickier. It's um, not going to be locked to NVIDIA GPUs or it's still will it's, be? It's, a lot of the code is still in CUDA. And so that can be, it's, it is what, definitely what is better CUDA, for NVIDIA GPUs. CUDA is a programming language specifically for NVIDIA GPUs. So it's a lower level language. I haven't actually done it myself. So I, don't, I, I would, in my head, like it's a shader language. I don't think that's true. Um, <laughs> but kind of like one of those really low level, you know, uh, uh, good at doing batch matrix multiplications. And, you know, it's a, it's a GPU programming language. It basically speeds things up compared to, say, Python. You know, a lot of uh, machine learning code is done in Python, particularly like the PyTorch library. Python's a notoriously slow programming language. Um, easy to write in, but it doesn't run very quickly. And so a lot of the actual um, underlying stuff is Python calls that end up calling C, C++, CUDA code, much faster stuff that then can run things a thousand times faster or whatever. But the problem is CUDA is specifically NVIDIA's language. It doesn't, it doesn't translate to things like Apple Silicon, um, there's been a lot of work put in by Apple to try to get full PyTorch support on Apple Silicon, but it has taken a while. They are not quite there yet. So a lot of things still fall back to CPU and it could be a lot slower. Um, they have some stuff like this MPX thing to make it better, but a lot of that still falls back to CPU. So we'll do what we can to try to support um, Mac. I mean, I've got a Mac laptop. I want to be using that as well. Um, but it you know, kind of ends up being some, some framework support issues, issues as well. But ideally, if we can get this working really efficiently, it'll run on CPU. Not as quickly. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll still take like 30 seconds to render or something. But that would be ideal. Why, um, why is GPU faster for this kind of stuff? So at the core of it, a lot of machine learning stuff relies on matrix multiplications and linear algebra. So taking you know, a representation of a whole image and running it through a matrix to, to project it to some other 
mathematical space. Doing that, you know, a thousand times over one run through of a model. And GPUs having been created for, I mean, you know, the the main obvious use case was things like computer gaming, which also is basically just a bunch of matrix, matrix, matrix multiplications. Matrix mm-hmm. multiplying, take the whole world and you want to rotate it, that's multiplying it by some rotation matrix. Um, so it just so happened that we already had large-scale consumer hardware that was good at doing the mathematical operations for machine learning quickly. Mm. Um, There are other kinds of chips like Google's TPUs, um, Intel's Gaudi chips, uh, I mean, Apple Silicon, that are trying to do similar things. Um, Some of them can be even even more specific towards uh, machine learning operations, maybe taking off some of the things that would be more useful for gaming and graphics, but not needed for machine learning, things like that. I'm not super deep into the hardware side. This is kind of me rambling about things I've generally (laughs) heard. Um, Mm. But yeah, it it really comes down to just like the core operation behind a lot of machine learning is large matrix multiplication. And GPUs are just specific hardware that's made to do that really quickly. Gotcha. What is the main use case that you're noticing people are using the text-based uh, version of uh, what is it called? The one on St- stable audio. Stable audio. Yeah. What is like the main, um, like main thing that people are using that I've for? Seen, you find? I honestly wish I had a better view into what people are ac- actually using it for. You know, I'll, I'll look on on Twitter posting about stable audio, um, and sometimes it's people who are like AI maximalists. Who are like, here's an AI video I made with visuals from runway and and you know vo- voices from 11 labs and music from stable audio um then there's a lot of people i've talked to who are just using it for sample generation um there's a guy on my team josiah who is working on an album um with stable audio his, his job is basically model qa write music here's the models find good creative ways to use them sounds Something like a sick job to be honest <laughs> it's it's a pretty great job I'm, I'm glad i'm able to to provide that um uh, but it's important because it's like, you know, we have a, a, a goal as part of our community of like, we want to be helping musicians. We want to make things. It, it's, it can be pretty easy to make things that are good novelty value or good yeah, virality. Or like a technical feed um, or whatever, but not really useful. Right. But not particularly useful. And so, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot to, a lot to, to do on, on that side. Um, but it's been nice to, to, you know, see artists making, making samples, making them better. Um, or even like, you know, make make a full song, get some inspiration from that or, or remix it or whatever. Um, yeah. And then and then the the next stage here. So text prompting fundamentally isn't a great interface. Yeah, it doesn't audio. make sense, I think. Like every right. time I've tried it, because everybody has their own subjective words for describing right. music. It's like what is fat and warm and wobbly yep. and you know gooey to one person might be like yeah. uh squidgy and right uh something else to another person so a, yeah a, a thick kick drum means a different thing to an electronic producer versus a rock drummer gotcha yeah um, yeah and then lower like a hip-hop guy where a thick kick drum might mean like a big 808 and to a right, dubstep right. guy it might mean actually something that has a lot of click on the trans yeah yeah it either means big tail <laughs> or no tail or right. something like that um so that, that that's one of the the issues is that it, it can work for kind of more wrote things like give me a 128 bpm tech house drum loop like that's pretty you know there's a lot of variation in that it'll be trickier to give it specifically like i want this eqing on the kicks or whatever um but it can give you kind of the 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 general the general thing of it but yeah the problem is like we just don't have good language for audio even if we do have a large data set of you know human written prompts and descriptions for audio that they made they can be very detailed People aren't sure how to prompt for it. I mean, regardless of of production experience, um, mm-hmm. so that's why we're looking into more kinds of control mechanisms for these models. Yeah, I mean, um, so one things like, possibility, I guess, would be to give people like the the text prompt input instead of just being a box where you write whatever you want in there. Maybe it could also be that, but then underneath have a bunch of tags that you can kind of yeah. click and or like maybe give people a little survey with like four right. or five questions or something. But then it's like, yeah. Yeah, so there's an aspect here of like kind of meeting halfway of some education and some just like better intuitive interfaces. Mm-hmm. So we added a prompt library to give like here's just some basic prompt. Click on, you know, here's one for 
indie rock. Here's one for classical. Here's one for whatever, whatever. I know it's, you know, it's uh, uh, some, some pre can prompts to come up with that. If you use those pre can prompts, will they generate a new thing every time? Yes. Okay. Uh, because of that, the that's the other reason then maybe why it's not so good is, is like yeah. the generative side of AI is great, but also you do want to have some control there, which is why I like right. Dance Diffusion because you can you can get to almost exactly what you want at the output, even if it is got some like wiggle room and, and stuff. Whereas yeah, I feel yeah. like with a text prompt, you go like give me a big fat bass, and I give you a new one every time, and and there's no real way to sort of like uh, and wrangle it and, and get it to do specific things right and it's trickier when it's when it's a black box as well that you don't have control you can't fine tune on your own stuff um and you don't know exactly what it was trained on and what you know or i mean you can go look at audio sparks and see the data in there and see their descriptions and try to match things but it's not a particularly exact science so you can do things like fixing the seed um so the reason you get a different result from the same prompt twice is that we will randomize the white noise we, we start with and that white noise essentially is what determines kind of the path towards uh, 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 a sample and Wait, so changing that noise gives you a different you, sample. Uh, so if you if you have that exact same white noise twice with the exact same prompt twice, it will give you the same output. It will give you the same output, right? Oh, so we, okay. we do have a thing now that wasn't there when you first tried to cite to to be able to add in a seed, fix that seed, and then you know tweak the prompt smaller amounts to try to get it to mm. go more towards what you want. Okay. Um, but you know these these things are also it's like these these shortcomings are also why I'm really looking forward to the open source models. Because once we have those out, you know, you can get a lot more control over it, fine tuning it on your own library, coming up with your, with your own prompts and how to generate that from, from your samples. Um, doing things like audio conditioning. So instead of trying to put in a text prompt, just put in another kick and say, give me a thing kind of like this. Mm -hmm. um, I think that at the core of it, one of the tricky truths about generative AI is that the most simple um, like core process here is creating something random, creating a random thing from the data distribution, which may be the distribution of finished songs or whatever. And so that's the starting point is being able to make something. Then it's about adding in control, composition of different models. You know, you look over at the image side and they have now things like control nets. So I can take a different image and say, take the the pose of the person in this one and transfer that pose over or the overall style of this one and transfer that over. Um, having a lot more granular control as opposed to just having text prompts so that the text prompts can end up being kind of more like a, if you want to do it, if it will guide you more towards the sound or whatever you're going for, that can be helpful. Um, but adding in a lot more granular control. So that's that's kind of one of the tricky things about this and why I think it can cause some some controversy. Well, there's a lot of reasons it can cause controversy, mm -hmm. but people being like, well, it's just making the songs. Why I, I don't want it to make songs. It's like, right, that's the first step is that it can make the outputs. Then it's actually more stuff to make it more controllable versus classical synthesis, which is like the basic operations are basic shapes, delay, gain, filters, things like that. Mm. That you then have to compose all of those into a final track, which the tools won't just give you automatically. So it's kind of this inverted process of like the easiest thing to do, like with Dance Diffusion, right? That's just the most basic operation of just denoising. What it does is it makes things like what you give it. Mm. And so I think it can be tricky there where it's like, it can seem like it's just, wait, why are you making this just shortcut thing when there's no work involved? It's like the being able to control it more comes comes after that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. A lot of people like who look at these AI things and they're like, yeah, it's not that good. This is not right. This is not right. It's like, yeah, but th it's never going to be worse than this. Like this right. is, it's impressive where it's at even now and it's only going to get better. Um, and then it's a comparison also of what you're comparing it against. Like if it's, mm. you know, if you're going to be comparing it with, uh, uh, trying to get it to match current existing, you know, workflows, it might not be ever, ever quite the same. Like think mm -hmm. about like, you know, synthesizers trying to recreate a trumpet sound or whatever. So they add an ADSR envelope and maybe some distortion on some things from like a square wave or whatever. And so you end up with, you know, an approximation of a trumpet, but it's fundamentally, it's kind of its own thing. And so I right. think that it being a new form of synthesis there's going to be some aspects because it is 
you know, predictive and can take on some elements of existing things, it'll also have its own quirks. I'm interested to see, you know, taking it as its own thing, where does that go? Right. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, in terms of style transfer stuff, like you said, you can take a pose from one person and apply it to another. How far are we off that uh, equivalent in audio? Like, for example, I really like how this tipper song is mixed and mastered. Uh, apply that mastering and mix to my song. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you've already got things like reference mixing in Ozone, right, where you can put that in, and, and that can end up being a bit more... Um, uh, uh, there's more handcrafted stuff going on there. It's kind of a question of it's, like it's which useful, things. It's useful, but it's more like I mean, that's more like metering almost. I would say right. Um, yeah, having it. How, more... how far are we? Are just sort of like basically like AI upsampling, I suppose. Like take yeah. this thing that's mono generate. I mean, you can almost do that with Combobulator now. Like you can put right. some, Combobulator on something, turn the width all the way up, put a utility after it that just has the side information, render that, and then blend it in with your mono signal, and you get like generated side information, which doesn't There's some sound interesting stuff with things like Combobulator that is based on Rave, where it technically generates in mono. Is it not just Rave? Is, a, it, is it their own It thing? is just Rave. Uh, yeah, they, they, they were the first company to get an actual license from EarCam to be able to to include Rave in their products. That's that's mm. great. I mean, I, I love Rave, um, you know, short for real-time audio variational autoencoder. I love how they, you know, I, I'm always a fan of, of clever technical pun names. Um, yeah, so... It kind of comes down to like, can you get a good feature space that lends itself to that operation of mixing and mastering? And probably a um, data set, right, of like a bunch yeah. of masters and a bunch of pre-masters so you can compare the two. Automated mixing and mastering is an interesting one because there's a few different ways to approach it of like, do you give it stems? Do you give it a pre-master thing and hope that it can kind of just pick it all apart in there? Um, there's a lot of good literature on that that I'm not quite as quite as aware of i think that part of the tricky thing with automated mixing and mastering is that a lot of current ai technology because of either the model capacity or the issues with the auto encoder will lend themselves to a bit of quality degradation um and so you know if it if it can if it can master it but in doing so it loses something else that adds an extra trade-off i mean that happens um, in mastering anyway though. right Right. It's so like usually it's um, a trade off of volume and quality and you kind of got to pick your battle there. Do you want it to be yeah. louder than everything else, but it's going to have a bunch of distortion or do you want it to be somewhere in the middle or are you going to go no distortion at all, but very quiet? Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see how that one progresses. We don't have active work on that right now, so I don't want to give uh, a timeline on that because I know there's other labs doing some great stuff there. Um, but things like style transfer, um, that's pretty well established. Um, I've had a thing I've been thinking about lately. So comparing things like, so, so rave and things like, um, the singing voice transfer things, you know, voice changer into Drake or whatever, they work on kind of the same principle of having a constrained latent space. So that audio, you know, that, that encoding space that can then it, it's constrained in what it can actually decode to. So the way that rave works is that it's basically overfitting on your data set. But it's overfitting in a way where you have to be giving it data for it to have an output. There's no, well, there is unconditional sampling from Rave. It's its own thing. Um, but if you, um, Rave is basically like, like you have a compression model where you're training these models to, you know, recreate the audio input, but having some compressed data bottleneck in the middle so it has to learn how to compress things. Rave takes that to a bit of, a bit of an extreme where it has a very compressed data bottleneck. And it, you know, has to be very noise resistant. There's some some VAE stuff they do there, but basically it learns to overfit itself to the data set. What does overfit um, mean? Overfitting is essentially it will just spit out the actual data again. So in, in the case of, say, dance diffusion, if you were to fine tune that on 10 kick drums, then eventually it will just learn that the space of everything in those is those 10 kick drums and it will only ever make those so one of those 10 kick drums right it won't actually the, the alternative is generalizing where it will can it not make, make some, like some new thing it won't make every combination of those 10 kick drums as well right it, it, eventually if it's if it's overfit that means that it's just like it's, it's memorizing oh, right? it's going to spit out yeah. training data gotcha um 
But in terms of auto encoders, in terms of those compression models, which also end up being just like style transfer models, is you overfit it to say the sounds of Mr. Bill or the sounds of someone playing breakbeats so that the only output that it knows how to do is in that sound space. Mm. And so it's doing style transfer by basically overfitting with style. It's like, no matter what you give me, I'm going to output a Mr. Bill sounding thing mm. where it's like a, which, a uh, properly way, fit auto encoder. Which, by the way, exists now for people listening. If you go to datamindaudio.ai, I think is the website, there is a Mr. Bill model there now. And you can have it overfit Mr. Bill stuff over uh, whatever you put into it in real time, which is, it's crazy that it's real time. That's mind blowing. Yeah. And that's because of this autoencoder <laughs> thing is that it's, it's real time because it's not actually needing to look at long distance things, not really aware of what happened two seconds ago. Right, it only has to sense. work on that very small time frame, which is what makes style transfer models um, easier to train overall because you are you, you don't have to generalize it to some massive data set. You're specifically trying to overfit on some some timbre, some style, so that any audio that comes in is basically mapping itself to the closest part of its training data of what you gave it in. Um, things like RVC make it even more explicit by explicitly like, I am going to store this many latents. It can only pick specifically from these, from these encodings. Um, but yeah, basically, you know, this this model only knows how to generate things in the sound space of Mr. Bill. So if you give it a thing outside of that space, it'll be like, I'm going to have to kind of map that to the closest sound that I know to make, which is this st style transfer. Whereas, so uh, style transfer models are overfitting with style. Generative models are underfitting with style. Mm -hmm. So underfitting is like, oh, it can't actually spit out anything that it was trained on. Um, it it's you know, there's like the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy quote of like to fl to learn to fly, you have to throw yourself at the ground and miss. So <laughs> I like to say that uh, training a generative model, you, you try to overfit your data set and miss. You mm -hmm. know, I tried to have it recreate these Jonathan Mann songs, but this model is not big enough to memorize 5,000 songs. So it starts making things that are kind of nearby instead, which is good and creative. And we like that. Right. Um, but, you know, taking things like much larger models, like I've been training for things like stable audio, try to train one of those on Jonathan Mann's data set, and it will start spitting out just like his actual songs after mm -hmm. enough, because there's not enough data for it to, to saturate that model. Right. Right. Um, where do you think AI is going uh, in the audio space specifically? Like, where do you think we're going to be in five years from now, 10 years from now, even one year from now? Um, and I guess like, yeah, where, where do you think it's going on like in like a t technological way? Like, what do you think we're going to be able to do in, in those timeframes? And then also, do you think it's going to cause a lot of problems? Like uh, a lot of people are all outraged about it causing like a lot of job loss and all, all this kind of stuff. And maybe, I mean, I think with any large new technology that's kind of revolutionary, there's going to be growing pains. That's always been the case yeah. in history. And it will, will, will be no different for AI most likely, but I'm pretty optimistic that it's going to remain a tool rather than a replacement yeah. for humans. Uh, but yeah, more, I mean, more interested in the technological side, like what are we going to be able to do on in the, in those times? It's hard to say in the next, I mean, even the next two years, just looking two years back, I think it just moved so quickly. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the easy answer is whatever you want. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think, I don't know. I really hope that that control gets a lot better. Being able to control your outputs and, and put in your intent, I think is really important. Mm. One of the things that I'm really excited about is personal reinforcement learning. Uh, so there's this idea of RLHF, reinforcement learning for human feedback. And that's basically how you can take these model outputs and then have people like kind of rate which one they like better than the other. And using that preference data, you can tweak the models to make things that are more towards that preference. I'm really so, so right now that can take a pretty large scale of data. Like you need, you know, to have a service and you collect stuff from your users, and then you've got two hundred thousand things to to work on, something like that. I'm really interested to see if we can get that working on a personal level. I think that a lot of producers would enjoy kind of that, like, all right, which of these sounds is more what you wanted? Pick that and kind of having it evolve over time into being more your taste. So I'm really looking forward to the more personal uses than like the, you know, per personal uses in local fine tuning things than 
having, you know, big paid services do everything we want. And, and with the way something like that work is it's like a program that's running in the background of your computer whilst you're doing stuff and it kind of learns how you behave in real time uh, and then over time gets better and better and eventually can kind of like take care of certain tasks, tasks for you. Is that, is that what you're saying or no? So I think there's a lot of ways to implement this. And so it's kind of just, you know, whichever one is the most most feasible. I think that monitoring DAW activity can be tricky just from an implementation standpoint. Um, you know, the, 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 the basic version I'm seeing of it is like you've got just a window with like it's going to keep generating two samples. You just kind of rank, you know, maybe three. You just kind of rank them which ones you like best. And then it kind of learns more over time. It's still just, you know, thoughts in my head. I've only seen this um, vaguely in practice on the image side. Um, but I think that's kind of what I'm really interested in. I think that there is this this issue that it, as you scale, if, if you try to make a model that works well for everybody, it ends up being not perfect for anybody. Right. It can. It can. And I think that particularly because music is so personal, cultural. Um, you know, if you try to make a model that only makes "quote unquote" good music. Do they think that dubstep is all bad music? <laughs> Will it just end up making classical? You know, um, I, I like music that others might think is not good music. And so I, I don't I don't want some sort of, you know, model tuned to everyone's preferences to just end up being, you know, top of the bell curve, middle of the road stuff. So I'm, I'm really interested in like kind of pushing against the narrative of this being some sort of like big tech takeover takeover of artistry. I really look forward to empowering creative technological people who want to dive into this and make it their own. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it's on it, anyone who wants that to happen to push it forward. Um, I think that there's a lot of concerns around, will this make a lot of soulless art? And my view on that is if it's heartless and soulless, then it's on you to add it yourself. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of heartless, soulless music out there already anyway. So. There's already plenty of it. I mean, know? a lot of the arguments um, people make it already is ha like, for instance, another argument that people make is like, uh, it's going to like wreck all the jobs and whatnot. And I mean, like if you, if you look at a, a performance now, like a, you go to an excision concert or whatever, that concert could happen without excision being there. Like it, it could just be run by a computer. It is basically all run by computers. Um, but we don't go there and just watch a stage with a computer on it. You know, we want to see a human up there. Right. And yeah, but um, I feel like the, yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the arguments people make it is, is like, well, that's not happening now and it's possible now. So why would it, right. why would it be the it's case? All, it's and, already possible to yeah. automate your entire process. Right. You know, you could go on, get, throw your, some Apple loops, throw on an ozone mixing thing, throw in an Apple drummer track and you got a new song and put that out. Yeah, exactly. Will it get you fans and sell tickets? Probably not. <laughs> Yeah, I think, or, I think and it, the other it, thing we're about, about making art as well is like it's important for artists or at least for me and most people that I've talked to about this to feel like some sense of ownership over the work as well. Yeah. And I don't get that feeling unless I put enough effort in basically. Right. And uh, like if I do a collab with someone, and I feel like I didn't do enough. You know, I, I don't even want to really put my name on it and yeah. vice versa. I've had, had that happen the other way as well. And yeah, so I think that's important. And if you can have an AI there that can just spit something out. Also, the other thing is I'm like so picky about art that like never has an AI spat out or another human for that matter that I wouldn't change in any way. There's like right. no song in the world I feel like that exists where I'm well, like, that's perfect. I wouldn't change anything about that. You know, music quality is not a global leaderboard. Right. Again, it's, it's personal. People do remixes not because they think that I can make this song better, or, you know, globally better, but I can make it more my own. Hmm. Um, so I think that I, I I don't think taste changes. I think taste stays like you're saying that that, you know, what do you want to put your name on? What would you actually be willing to put your name on and share? Um, that's taste. And that, I think, doesn't change with the you know, with how easy it is to make things. Um, and so I think that, you know, and also like Talking about how it'll affect jobs really depends on what jobs you're talking about. If you're talking about performing and touring DJs, I don't think that the actual output song artifacts are the entire make and break thing of their career. Right. It's like a there's tiny marketing, component. there's promotion. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I mean, half of you know, half of us to see on Twitter right now are artists complaining that half of their job is being a TikTok star. Right. right? 
that doesn't change if <laughs> if the song writing process ends up faster or if it can make a song for you. Mm. Um, I think that there is so much more in music, in community, that just having a thing that can spit out a song there's already people that can spit out a song and people will still start careers as musicians. You know, I saw someone when there was a, a, a release of an AI thing on Twitter, someone replying with like, look, you already live in a world where Skrillex exists. <laughs> like, you, but yet you still survive and make things. Like, it's okay. You can keep making things. Mm. What, what was his point? Um, I think that just like, there will always be things that are better than you. Oh, gotcha. That doesn't have to stop you. <laughs> True. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a good point. Because uh, yeah, another thing that people kind of seem to feel is that if there's this thing that can just do it, what's the point anymore? And yeah, I mean, exactly right. There's a lot of artists out there who can make stuff that you'll never make better than you're going to make it. And you'll think that it's better than your own stuff that you make, yet you still make music. Right. Mm. So I think that, you know, I... I I get why people can be concerned. There's a lot of change going on and it can affect things economically. Um, you know, I think it's, I, I can, I can compare it to previous changes in music. Like, you know, the, the rise of the DAW probably put some studio engineers out of work. Um, but I think that was still worth it, um, for the, you know, growth in music we've seen over the last 30 years or so, um, through the increase uh, the, the, like lowering the bar to getting music out there. You know, you know, you no longer have to go rent studio time to record things. You can do it in your own home studio. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think it's one to one the same, um, but I think it's easy with the with the rapid growth of technology. It's easy to extrapolate it to a worst case scenario, and with the cynicism of the music industry, it's pretty easy to extrapolate that to a bad case scenario. Um, but I think it'll be more complex than that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Curious to see where it goes, though. Um, yep. So I guess, like, to wrap up, uh, what are you excited about? What are you working on now? Where can people find you? Yeah, um, so uh, check us out at uh, harmonai.org. Um, Spell with... It's a pretty... Harm, like, yeah, H-A-R-M-O-N-A-I. Yep. Like harmony, but replace the Y with A-I. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Um, that is a pretty barren site, but it's got a link to our Discord uh, and that's where we are mostly having our conversations. We are currently working on the open source releases. Um, so that would be great if you're someone who wants to, to dive into that side of things. And then stableaudio.com, that's our, our service. You can try stuff out for free. We're also going to be adding in more things like uh, audio uploads for init audio to be doing things like text-based style transfer mm. of your inputs. Mm, yeah, interesting. Cool. Well, hey, man, I appreciate you doing this. It was um yeah, fascinating chat. I'm sure people get a lot of value out of it. Yeah, I really appreciate you bringing me on. It's been great. All right, cheers.